Hello, everybody. This is Chuck Carnival, co-founder of FastGraphs, the fundamentals analyzer software tool, aka Mr. Valuation, as most of you know me by. And that's kind of important for this video because today I'm going to cover what I consider to be a very high quality blue chip dividend growth stock that promises both some good current income and growth of future income, as well as capital appreciation. Of course, most importantly of all, I believe it's very attractively valued today. And as I think you all know who've been following my work, I find that very hard to come by. Another thing, I'm only going to be covering one stock in this video. I've been doing a lot of list videos where I've been covering you know, a lot of different companies and different industries, which are primarily introductory videos where you get a chance to see if the company's worth taking a closer look at. In this video, I'm going to look a little deeper into the dividend growth stock, pharmaceutical giant pharmaceutical company, Merck and & Company. And it's really a very interesting company to me, and there's some interesting attributes about pharmaceuticals that I think are worth mentioning as I kind of go through this presentation. So I'm going to start out looking at adjusted operating earnings. Now, since I'm only covering one company today, I want to try to interject some other common misconceptions, questions, and even confusion I get. Merck has a blended P.E. ratio of 12.54. Now, the first thing that confuses people is blended. Now, why, why we do this, a lot of people use trailing 12 months, and they'll, they'll usually, if you see the earnings report or the, the you know, where they list the earnings or the P.E. ratio, they'll say TTM on it. That stands for trailing 12 months. Others will use forward earnings. We try to use a combination of the two. Our earnings number will be based on an earnings calculation at somewhere between last reported earnings and the next year's reported earnings, primarily based on past earnings, present, and future earnings. That's why it's called a blended PE. But another question I get is, why are your PE ratios different on fast graphs than they are in other sites? Well, it really has to do with the different metrics. So I'm going to go to the new tool, new version of our tool that we're hoping to get out very quickly because it's fast or try to give you some insights by going through some different metrics. For example, if you use gap earnings or diluted earnings, you'll see that the blended PE then is over 20. And that'll still be a little bit different than what you might see in other sites because we're using the blended PE rather than the trailing 12 month or the forward PE as other companies utilize. So that's really one thing I want to point out. You'll see the PE ratio is really relevant to what metric. Now in fast graphs, we offer, you know, all these different earnings metrics, different cash flow metrics, and what we call intrinsic value correlations, things like EBITDA, EBIT, and also currently net change in cash. In our new version, we're going to be offering price to sales in lieu of this net change in cash. That's something to look forward to. But let's go ahead and look at the adjusted operating earnings because this is one of the ones that I use most for valuing a company, at least at my first cut at valuation, because, you know, earnings are what's reported. You're going to see a bunch of earnings estimates. You know, you look at any site, Zacks, Morningstar, financial blogs like Seeking Alpha, and, you know, so on and so forth. You're going to see a lot of earnings estimate data given, and they're going to talk about earnings reports. They're going to talk about whether the company beat earnings or missed earnings, etc. So earnings is kind of the go-to metric that I utilize when I'm valuing a stock. And it's a very important metric because I I also have discovered through, you know, over almost 50 years of doing this, that it really is the best correlation for getting what I call the first cut at valuation. So let's look at Merck and let's look what the adjusted operating earnings tell us about this company. Now, number one, I do want you to see that historically, there's been a relative flatness in Merck's earnings, you know, up through about 2017. You can see it here by looking at the change per year, you know, where earnings grew 8%, no one, then 0%, then minus seven, minus 11, minus three. That's this drop in earnings we see here. Then no growth again, then a very high rate of growth coming into the Great Recession, and then followed by single digit 7% growth. And again, coming into recession, negative growth. Now this is important because I do want to focus on the fact that we went through the Great Recession here and Merck really had you know really strong numbers relative to many companies that really suffered big earnings drops. They did see a small drop in earnings in 2009 of minus 5%. But then they followed that with, again, some pretty flat growth. But then I want you to note that starting around 2016, maybe even more relevantly, 2017 to 2018, 
we started to see an acceleration in Merck's growth. That's a result of one really key drug that they have. But the point is, you can see the growth rate accelerated. So historically, over this long period of time, our growth rate is 4.2%, which is not very high. Now, this is an analytical tool. And when I'm analyzing an individual stock and spending some time on it, like I am here with, with Merck in this video, I go through a lot of machinations with my work. I'm going to drop this down to a 10-year graph. Now, a 10-year graph in this case includes two and a half years of estimate data, if you will. Okay, that's the light green shaded area. So it's not 10 years of history, I want to be clear. And this is a kind of an interesting graph is because you can see that Merck has really been a 15 multiple company over this time frame. And we're going back here to the beginning of 2014 through current. And you can see that when Merck's price was above the orange line, which is a PE of 15, and the blue line, which basically is the same number, a PE of 15.43, it kind of moved back into alignment and then, you know, got above it, moved back into alignment, got above it for a short period of time, moved back into alignment. And today we can see Merck trading at a blended PE of about 12.5, as I mentioned earlier. I consider that very, very attractive. That gives me an earnings yield of 7.98%. I like to see a minimum earnings yield of 65 to 7%. So 7.9, we'll call it 8%, is very, very attractive. The dividend yield of 3.37 is also very attractive. Now, dividend yield is another valuation metric that I often like to check on a dividend-paying stock. And this is a dividend contender Merck has had 10 consecutive years of increasing their dividend. Prior to that, they had frozen the dividend for a period of years, but they've primarily been increasing their dividend every year for 10 years, which makes them a dividend contender on the CCC list, the Champions, Contenders, and Challengers list that Justin Law, who's a fellow associate of mine on the Dividend Kings website, is the curator of. It's a list of real high quality, not necessarily all high quality, but dividend stocks, paying stocks with streaks of, you know, zero to 10 years, 10 to 25 years, and of course, 25 to above. So um, the champions are the ones that have 25 years or above. A contender is 10 to 25 years, and that's where Merck fits in this category. But I'll use this overlay on fast grass, and that's my dividend yield overlay. Now, what I want you to notice over this short time frame here is when the price is lowest, okay, like here the PE was only 10 back in January of 2012, that's when the dividend yield is highest. You could have bought Merck with a 4% yield then. When the dividend yield got a little higher, you know, we saw a yield of about 3%. But then I also want you to see something else here that's very important when you're analyzing stocks. I want you to see the dividend payout ratio is the area below this white line. This white line is a plotting of the dividends. And you can see that Merck has consistently increased its dividends over the time frame that I've got on the screen right now. And the reality of it is, as you get into later years here, you know, you start to see the dividend payout ratio in the 40% range. So let's go ahead and evaluate that. You know, the dividend payout ratio has been between 50, 45, and 50%. The dividend growth rate since 2012 has been about 5%. Now, by the way, that's reasonably consistent with the company's earnings growth rate over this time frame of 5.93%. But I also want you to note something else. Everything is relative to the time frame you're measuring. So if I cut a couple more years out of this graph, all of a sudden now my growth rate has increased to 7.99%. Now that's telling me that growth is accelerating, not only by the numbers I'm looking at here, but I can see it visually as I kind of expand out again, I can see this acceleration in earnings growth here. All right. So, you know, I've got a decent dividend yield. I've got good valuation you know, valuation at the end of last year when the stock was a little bit pricier, the dividend yield was about 3.03%. Today, it's 3.37. I would call that an attractive yield for this company. It's a yield that basically puts me in a position where I'm getting above market yields, which I like, and I can buy the stock at a low valuation. Merck has a double A minus credit rating and only has 41% long-term debt to capital. Now, this company's made numerous acquisitions. Most noteworthy was Shearing Plow years ago, which was a multi-billion dollar acquisition. I forget the exact number now, but they're also going to be spinning some things off and I'm going to be covering that here in a moment. But what I want to talk about here at this stage of the video is to point out, and here you can see how important this dividend overlay is 
when the price was real high is when the dividend yield is lower. And when the price is real low is when the dividend yield is higher. You know, but coming out of the Great Recession, you could have bought Merck with a 5% dividend yield on December of 08. And of course, very few people had the courage to be buying stocks back then. But it's really when you should have been buying stocks because that's when you got the most bang for your buck because that's where you got the growth of the company, the dividend, and then this P.E. ratio expansion that occurred along the way as well. So that's all. In, those are all important things to consider when you're looking at these stocks. But here we have a company whose growth rate is beginning to accelerate a little bit from the 4 to 5% range that I've shown you so far on this video. Now, in more recent times, to the 7 or 8% range, and even over the last several years, it, it approached 9.7%. Now, that's very important when I go to the next phase here, because my next phase now is going to be looking at forecasting, all right? Forecasting, I always start by looking at, at the forecasting calculators on the fast graph. We have five of them, actually. We have the regular estimate, which values the stock based on a formula for valuing a stock, which is a 15 PE. We also use the normal multiple, which is the multiple that the market has valued the stock at on average. And as we saw earlier, that's been about 15 as well, a little bit higher, 15.49. So that's the PE valuation line I'm using here. Remember, these are forecasting calculators. And not only is it a calculator, they're what if situations. What if Merck earns this amount of money? And what if it trades at these multiples that are all listed on the side here? Now, some other things about the earnings estimate calculator that I think you always want to check is you want to look at the trend of estimates, and we give you that also in the fast graphs. So I'm going to go back to the normal estimate here. You can see that six months ago, analysts were forecasting $5.31. Three months ago, that forecast went up to six seventy-three. dollars then the most previous estimate was $6. Now that's dropped. That dropped to $594, which came in to the actual number that they earned on 2020. These are 2020 numbers here. So, you know, the estimate went from $530 up to $6, and then it settled in and came in at $594. I'll show you how that'll be registered as a miss a little bit later. More recently, for this fiscal year, which is what really matters most to us because we can't buy the past, we can only invest in the future. Estimates were $6.34 six months ago, $6.54 three months ago, and then the most previous estimate was $6.49, which is currently where Merck is sitting at. Now, these numbers, then we go out, we have a 10% increase expected in 2022, followed by a 5% and a 9%. Now, all of these numbers are pre the already pre-announced situation that Merck has announced that they're going to be spinning off their women's health business. And that's something that I'll be covering here a little bit later. It's called the Organon spinoff. And that's happening in June 2nd is when the spinoff is actually going to occur. So I want to come back to that. But what I want to point out is right now, these numbers are not taking that into consideration. This is the sum of the parts, if you will. In the future, these estimates are going to change because we're going to see the Merck estimate plus the spinoff number. And I'll talk more about that in a moment because, you know, what I'm really trying to do is get you to understand how to use these estimates. Now, the forecast growth rate over these next three years, which is what we have data on from FactSet, is for 8.48%. But I want you to notice the number is 649 for this fiscal year, 715 for next fiscal year. If I go into Yahoo Finance and check other estimates and look at their numbers, they've got 648 for this fiscal year and 727. All right, so that's a little bit of a discrepancy, 649 instead of 648, and we have 715 instead of their 727. So, but the numbers are comparable. That's what I want to get clear. People ask me, what estimates, which ones do I trust? Well, you know, I don't really trust any of them. I trust all of them. What I'm really trying to determine is, are these numbers reasonable? And then I can go into Standard & Poor's, which is utilized by Seeking Alpha, and I get estimate data from Standard & Poor's as well, and I get 647 for 2021, which is consistent. I get 749 for 2023 and 715, rather, for 2022, which is consistent, again, with what I'm seeing on FastGraph. So in this case, FactSet and Standard & Poor's are giving me about the same numbers. Now, I don't stop 
there. You know, this gives me the starting point to look at. I also go into sites like Zach's. And Zach's gives me numbers as well. You know, I get earnings estimates and earnings growth rates. Now, Zach says the current year's growth rate is 8.9. And then they say next year is going to, earnings are going to grow at 5.7%. And then the past five years, they said 10.3, which is basically the same number, you know, we get because it's, it's an actual number. And then the next five years, they're estimating 6.10%. Now, I bring that up because if I go to the three to five year calculator, I want you to note that fast graphs that can census from fast graphs is 8%. Now that's pretty much in line with the company has recently achieved. I want you to keep that in mind. If I go into Yahoo Finance and look at their next five years, remember fact set is saying three to five years. These guys are saying next five years, they're saying 9.22% and Zach's is saying 6%. Now what can I do with that kind of data? Well, I can go into fast graphs here. I can move on to the custom calculator, all right? And the custom calculator gives me the ability. I'm going to just use these numbers round. I'm going to put in the 6% that Zach's talked about. This would be my low estimate of the estimate data that I have available. And I can then look at long-term growth based on a 6% growth rate. And I can calculate my returns. And they look, you know, very, very attractive. If I go into the 9.2%, I believe it was, that I saw on, I guess that was Yahoo. I forgot which one it was on. That was on Yahoo. Then I run these numbers and I get much better earnings growth rates. So this is a more positive estimate. Obviously, 9.2% growth is better than 6 But then, of course, if I just, you know, go to my default growth rate, which is what FactSet is giving me, and um, look at their numbers, which is 8%, I get some pretty good calculations at all. But I want you to notice, I hope you notice, these calculations are all, the 8 9% numbers are very similar. This is 48%, the 9% number was something like 50%. So these are all reasonable. Another thing that I like to do is I like to check the historical compound annual growth calculator. Now, the five-year growth rate has been 10.6%. Remember, we looked at that number before. So here we're just using, instead of using analysts, we're using a historical growth rate if they can achieve that. But I also have the ability with this drop down to review a lot of other historical growth rates. And, you know, more recently, it's been about 8%. So this is about as close as I can get to that 8%. And then this gives me using, you know, just a historical growth as a proxy, if you will, uh, instead of analysts. There's the 9.2 plus percent growth that we saw off of Yahoo Finance. And I can even come in here and find the 6% growth or pretty close to it that, you know, Zach's is saying. And again, I can, you know, corroborate all those numbers. But here's also something critically important. I'm going to go back to what I say with the Zach's estimates. Now, we created an analyst scorecard. One of the things when I'm analyzing analyst estimates and trying to come up with an estimate that I feel comfortable with, and again, I like to run a best case, a moderate case, and a worst case scenario, if you will, that I think is practical. And when I'm doing that, you know, I then like to check the analyst scorecard because what I want to know from this is how accurate are analysts generally when they're making forecasts one year in advance or two years in advance. And that's what we designed the Fast Graphs Analyst Scorecard to do. So what I want you to note here is if I look at the summary, this company has a perfect record. Now, what that tells me is they've given really good guidance, they've helped these analysts, and that this is a relatively easy company to analyze because, frankly, pharmaceutical stocks are pretty easy to analyze because, you know, once the drugs are approved and once they're doing sales, it's very easy to kind of calculate what the market is, what the sales of each of those drugs are, and all you got to do is add those numbers up. That's all the analysts have to do, I should say, and they come up with pretty good numbers, and then the company itself does that, and they give the analysts guidance, and that's a something we hope to be adding to fast graphs in the future and that's company guidance but the bottom line is when i look at the details of this stuff i can see that the analysts have been very accurate we apply a 10 percent margin of error let me show you that just so you're clear we provide a 10 percent margin of error when analysts are making the estimate 365 days in advance or one year in advance and we give them a two-year margin of error when they're more than, you know, one year or, or, or for the two year, because obviously there's going to be, you know, more chance of error the further out you go, the least accurate estimates are likely to be. But you can see this company has generally beat estimates most of the time over this time frame. And then same with the two year estimates, they've tended to beat estimates for the last several years, which has to do with some real key products like Keytruda and other drugs that the company has in their pipeline. So, you know, while I'm determining here 
is I've got a company here that when I'm looking at their forecasts and the analyst forecasts, I get kind of a warm and fuzzy here that these numbers might be reasonable. And then I can look at historical growth rates and assess that relative to the forecast and say, again, these numbers are reasonable. So I think these numbers are all very reasonable. Now, I do have a problem, however. This is, as I mentioned earlier, the sum of the parts. So I also need to take that into consideration. All right, so now I'm going to start looking for data. And I, and I also want to learn a little bit about the company. So what I'm going to do is I go into the company's website. And the first thing I did was I found their most recent earnings presentation here. Okay, this was their quarter one 2021 earnings presentation. And I go through here and I start looking at some of their numbers. And there's your gap and non-gap performance numbers. And then, you know, the, this is the key Truda that I talked about earlier, which I'll bring up here in a moment. Their oncology was a strong area of growth for them. And they've got a lot of drugs, as I'll show you here in a moment, treating cancer. Their vaccine business was a little weak. A lot of that probably had to do with the COVID and, you know, everyone being focused on that. But their pneumonia vaccines and so on were not as robust as they have been historically. Hospital, though their hospital sales were very strong, 11% up year over year. Their animal health was very strong, up 15%, but that's not a big, big part of their group. And then this, of course, is where they show the different performance. Now, they do give some pretty decent financial results. You know, their gross margins on GAAP and their non-GAAP gross margins were very, very high. Their earnings estimates were relatively modest. A lot of that had to do with COVID. They do then give the full year 2021 guidance that I mentioned to you earlier. So they give that to analysts. So I spent a lot of time on these kind of reports. And then, as I mentioned earlier, this brings me now to the spinoff. Now, the spinoff is going to be very, very tricky. That's coming, as I mentioned, on June 2nd. So you're going to have to factor that into your work. Now, what I've done for you to do that is I've gone through here and I found some research on here. And this is a report from Lark Research assessing the impact of the or Organon spinoff on Merck. That he gives th this particular analyst, Stephen Prococo, I assume that's how you pronounce his name, <laughs> gone through and he's crunched the numbers as analysts you know, tend to do. This gentleman's a CFA. He has estimated Merck's projected earnings excluding half a year of Oregonans' results under the assumption that the spinoff will be completed in June will be $5.15 on a gap basis and $6.12 on a non-gap basis. That in compares with management's guidance without adjusting for the spinoff of 5.52 to 5.72 and a gap of 6.48 to 6.88. Okay, but uh, the spinoff is going to have a, an impact. So he points out here the big question is, on many investors' mind is how were the market value Merck shares post spinoff? And obviously, if you're going to take a position in Merck now, which by the way, it might make sense to wait until the spinoff occurs, depending on how the market reacts to it, of course, where you might, because you're going to you know, be able to choose Merck and or the Oregon, and now you would be getting both of them. But according to Steve's analysis here, he estimates that earnings will be distributed Oregon and spinoff will be worth about $7 a share to Merck shareholders. And he implies that the rest of Merck will be valued at $70.53 a share. Now, that's remember, that's a $77 stock today. So that's something to keep in the back of your mind. But again, the, the two together equal Merck's current value. It's valued at 13 times Oregon. Oregonan is valued at 13.7 times projected gap earnings and 11 times non-gap earnings, which are the adjusted operating earnings that I often show. So then he, he goes into Oregonan's full year projected results, and he estimates that Merck's retained business will generate gap earnings of 476 and non-gap earnings of 572. By the way, that explains where you're starting to see these, you know, earnings estimates dropping on Seeking Alpha site when you get out here to 2028 and 2029. I'm assuming, I'm not necessarily positive, I'm just, because that, that really struck me when I first looked at it. But he says now, excluding their results, you know, Merck's earnings are going to be 476 and 572, and he values that. They're valuing the current Merck at about 14.8 times projected gap earnings and 12 times non-gap earnings. 
Now, again, that's close to what, you know, we're seeing here. That would be up here on these numbers that we're, you know, forecasting here. But here's the point I want to really get at that I think is important about this, this particular spinoff. He says, that does not factor in the cash that Merck will receive. And he says, you know, according to his analysis, the total value distributed to Merck will be worth $18 billion, but Merck will receive $9 billion in cash that it is distributing to its shareholders a little over 9.2% of the company's total equity value of $196.4 billion, but only 4.6% of its equity value adjusted for the receipt of cash. So, you know, the basic core Merck, you're still, if you bought Merck today, you'd still be holding pretty much, you know, about 95 plus percent of the whole company. And you'd also be getting the spinoff shares, which are, you know, really considered to be a good investment because they're going to free up the woman's health business and allow them to grow faster and better. And they're also going to free up some of Merck. At least that's the thought process behind all this. So as I go through Merck, I'm going to kind of summarize it by going through the company here with the new version of Fast Graphs, just because it's so much faster. I've got good earnings growth based on consensus estimates, notwithstanding the fact that, you know, I've got a spinoff coming, which is going to impact this so much, but I'm buying the whole, which that includes the spinoff, at a good valuation today. I look at it from operating cash flow, which gives me some dividend coverage safety. I don't even care about stock price so much when I'm looking at this. Merck generally covers their dividend with operating cash flow consistently. And then, of course, the asset test, as I already say, is free cash flow. And Merck pretty much has had free cash flow that has covered the dividend. There is some expectations of free cash flow dropping a little bit. And by the way, none of this takes into consideration the fact that this company will be doing a lot of acquisitions and possibly even some future spinoffs. So that's still to be determined, but that's always the issue. And then finally, I want to take a look at price to sales here because this is another, I think, good valuation metric. And I'm going to get rid of some of this historical data here and just look at Merck's price to sales more recently. You know, it's trading at about a normal price to sales of around, you know, three and a half to four times sales. It's currently trading at 3.9 times sales, which is slightly above the 3.8 historical that I'm looking at, you know, since 2012. The long-term historical price to sales has been about 3.7. So all these things are in a line. Anyway, the bottom line is this is Merck. Now, the key is, you know, I would spend a lot of time when I'm looking at a stock like this. I will go back into the company's website. I will look at their pipeline. These are the drugs that they have in phase two. They got 36. These are the drugs in phase three, which is the, more, the most likely to be approvals. They've got 23. They've got six under review, which are pending approval currently. And one of the things that I think is important is that, you know, a lot of the drugs that, you know, Merck suffered a lot of loss of, uh, of exclusivity or patent loss on some of their drugs. They're kind of past that now. Keytruda doesn't really lose patent until 2028. And that company represents about 25% of their sales and their growth currently. So there's a lot of, I think, value in this company. It's an extremely high quality company. It's got a good dividend yield. It's got a good dividend history. You know, the dividend growth rate, I don't know that the company's ever cut their dividend, but they on occasion have frozen the dividend. They did from, you know, 2006 up here through 2010, but they went through the Great Recession without cutting the dividend. I think that's important. Their growth rate has been about three and a half or four percent, which is consistent with their historical earnings growth. I would assume their future dividend growth will be consistent with their future growth. And by the way, both companies, this, the new spinoff as well as the parent, have committed to continuing to pay a dividend for whatever that's worth. Anyway, this is kind of a little deeper look than I normally go through on Merck. I consider it to be a very attractive, you know, double A rated, blue chip dividend growth stock with good capital appreciation potential as well as dividend growth. You could buy it at a good value, and the spinoff could be a kicker because it can actually free both companies up to grow faster, and it could also get Merck back up to some PE expansion. That would be a speculation, but again, you might want to wait until the spinoff occurs in a couple of weeks, or you might want to you know, get in early and take a look at Merck now. I'll let you make that decision. Anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, give me a like, you know, give me a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't. I appreciate you and uh, look forward to talking to you again real soon.